Our next speaker is Dr. Latanya Sweeney. She's the founder and director of the Data Privacy Lab, an elected fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics, with almost 100 academic publications. <laughs> Being a luminary in data privacy, she had a long, successful history of weaving technology and policy together to remove stakeholder barriers to technology adoption. So it's great to be here. I want to thank Lucilla and Xiao Chen and UCSD for hosting this event. Um, this is, uh, for many of the same reasons that uh, Cynthia mentioned, this is a fantastic opportunity and a fantastic event. I think it's also really important that it's held in California. Because one of the things I love about Southern California and Hawaii is the incredible uh, blend of public and private spaces. You're walking through, and, and sometimes you don't know in, what we would call indoor furniture in the east is outside, and sometimes the outside is inside. And it's so appropriate for a discussion of data privacy in today's time because it's very confusing as to when we're doing something in the public or when we're doing something in private. What I thought I could contribute uh, to today's workshop, or today and tomorrow, is a brief and sort of personal view of the emerging discipline of data privacy. It's broader than differential privacy, and how is it? Because there's tremendous excitement, as it should be, for differential privacy, but to what extent, if we all put all of our mind power behind it, where we might end up or not? And what are some of the other important problems that need to be addressed, and how do we make this emerging discipline work? So I thought I would share the lineages and origins and some relationships to other disciplines and to society and also bring word of other future directions to the audience and all at the same time trying to keep it focused on medical data and on health data policy. I hope uh, also that you'll join us and several of us who are uh, attempting, who are attempting to actually help de develop the field. So the talk will start with a definition of the field of data privacy from my perspective and maybe some others. Um, its origins, some proposed remedies, what's been on the horizons. So data privacy, I would postulate, is the study of risk and utility in data sharing arrangements. Here I'm purposely trying to be broad to account for the full spectrum of data sharing problems that we see. Um, and that the goal is then to seek optimal solutions. It seeks sort of balanced and minimally invasive results. The work is cross-disciplinary. It includes politics and policy, business and economics, computer science and technology, and most importantly, the people who are actually in the domains of use. So for example, data privacy work in medical data combines politics, policy, computer science, healthcare, and medical research. Overall, data privacy doesn't limit itself to traditional existing solutions of policy and technology. It allows us to create innovative new ways forward. It can transform the traditional false belief that society has to choose between utility and privacy and allow us to pioneer some new solutions in technology and or policy uh, so that society can enjoy both privacy and utility. And that is its greatest promise, because in the absence of developing as a field, we will always find ourselves on the red. And it doesn't matter whether one has a great discovery in something like differential privacy or a great new way forward in terms of policy, the tensions that be won't allow you to get to the blue. You'll find yourself living in the red. So by data and data privacy, we usually mean personal data. And there certainly has been an explosion in the amount of information collected on individuals. So let me give you some examples. Um, okay, double slide. For most of us who were born in the United States, if you, in this room, uh, the following fields of information were collected at the time of your birth, and that information showed up at some municipality uh, local to you. Since 1999, with the advent of the Electronic Birth Certificate Database, the following fields of information are collected on each birth, drawn automatically out of the hospital information system. A copy is then sent on to a state, uh, to the state, and another copy sent on to CDC. It includes lifestyle issues of the mother. You can infer things like abortions, previous uh, pregnancies, and so forth, as well as educational and other information. I give you that example to show you, uh, to give you a sense 
of how, uh, just a, uh, one example of many, many, many more I could provide of the explosion in information on individuals. By privacy and data privacy, we usually mean issues arising from a conflict in a data sharing arrangement. So in addition to the explosion in data collection, there's also been an explosion in data sharing. This is in a before and after picture of HIPAA. Um, so this was in 1997 during the HIPAA discussions led by Paul Clayton, a group uh, that wrote about a, HIPAA, a hypothetical but typical patient named Alice and all the places her record could go. When this came out, it created quite a stir among the discussions that became known as HIPAA. Earlier this year, we repeated the experiment by looking at places that we could absolutely document, we're getting a copy of the uh, a hypothetical but typical patient named Alice's data, data record. And it was pretty amazing how, the, how, how much data sharing had grown under HIPAA. And that patients have no control, the data sharing is hidden, there's no basis for correcting values, the data could be either explicit, is either explicitly identified or re-identifiable. And it's a uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers says it's now a billion dollar market. In data sharing arrangements, there are usually three entities, the data subject, the entity receiving the data, and the entity providing the data. And these data sharing arrangements can chain. Sometimes the data subject is one or the other two, and sometimes not. So for example, Gmail would be an example in which the data subject uh, is the same as the data provider. Uh, a medical record request from a recipient would be an example where the data subject is the recipient asking the medical uh, hospital information system or their provider for a copy of their record. Um, in fact, credit reports give us an example where all three are distinct. Information about your credit is provided about you to a credit reporting agency, and then you have the right to ask for a credit report to review it or see it, but you, you cannot stop the flow of that data. So often the power of the entities in the data sharing arrangement are not equal, and that's what typically generates the conflict. Data, pro data providers can be empowered by privacy concerns, by regulation, by law, or other instruments. So an example would be the Merck Vioxx case. Merck is a large pharmaceutical company that produced a pain relieving drug named Vioxx. A 2004 study showed that Vioxx doubled the risk of heart attacks and strokes. Families of more than 3,000 users of the drug claim family members died of heart attacks or stroke. And so in 2010, Merck paid almost $5 billion to these families to settle these lawsuits. Now, as a scientist, you can ask yourself, why is it that Merck didn't settle sooner when the 2004 study came out? It's because they had a legal strategy that showed that most of the plaintiffs had confounding conditions that could have accounted for their heart attack or stroke. And so their lawsuits they attempted to defend on that basis to one after another show that anyone who's, who's claiming it was Vioxx that there was another reason. Eventually though, the plaintiff's attorneys requested that Merck provide the data that was used in the clinical trials that were a prerequisite to the public release and sale of the drug. And the plaintiff's attorneys believed that the clinical trial data would show an increase in heart attacks and strokes and that the belief would then be that Merck knew or should have known that the drug had serious side effects. Merck refused to release the data because of the privacy of data subjects. So I was asked whether the data could be re provided without revealing subject identity. And within a month of receiving my preliminary report, the case was settled. So this gives us an example of how these powers interplay. The reverse power arrangement exists also. Data recipients can be empowered by a service or a utility or by social welfare. A great example of this is public health. You can get some horrible disease or even some commonly occurring ones too, and public health has the right to be notified regardless of your wishes. Lawmakers have deemed that the greater good for society trumps personal concerns. Another example has been the homeless management information systems. The Bush administration gave hundreds of millions of dollars to build computer systems that track homelessness in the United States. The idea was that, every social, that for every social service a homeless person received, that, they, that that service would be recorded. That would be meals and shelter, medical services, and so forth. But it turns out that about a third of the homeless services are, victims, uh, are provided to victims of domestic violence. 
which during the 70s, there had been a rash of deaths of these victims, and a separate law had been passed, the Violence Against Women Act, which provided anonymity to domestic violence victims. This created a, a clash in the HMIS system, which was, in some cases, explicitly identifying uh, homelessness, homeless, uh, homeless people in order to, for them to receive service. After much investigation, we were able to show these risks, and then I was able to provide a multi-party computation that worked in real time that, in fact, could allow the, uh, the administration to learn the answers it wanted about utility uh, without violating the privacy. Even though they paid for a national license, and even though it worked perfectly and flawlessly in the state of Iowa, it was never used. And the reason it was never used is because they didn't want to give it to everyone. In both of the cases I described, data privacy work helped assess the validity of the claims and offered evidence and found ways that the data could be shared in a way that balanced privacy risk and utilities. I could give some more examples, but in the interest of time, let me move forward. So in, in, in all of these examples, in fact, I can give you lots of examples. I, just, I should just say I have had a tremendous opportunity in life. It's very rare. But since 1995, I think I've been involved in every privacy, major privacy incident in the United States, at least if it appeared on the, Walls, uh, on the New York Times, in the New York Times. And it's been an incredible journey and an incredible vantage point, which is actually on the basis of which I come to you today. Not limited to medical privacy, not limited to a computer science perspective, but in fact showing why we continue to lose. And we will continue to lose until we learn to unite. Data privacy is the study of risk and utility and data sharing arrangements. That utility translates to utility, benefits, usefulness, and profits for the recipient often. And the risk can be a violation of an explicit law or regulation. It could be explicit harm to the data subject or economic loss. One of the things I did was I did a survey of all the disciplines over which I've had to interact in any, in, in any detailed way over any of the projects that I've worked on since 1995. And I found that each of these fields constantly had noteworthy contributions to make to data privacy. Um, but most of them are incident or domain specific and the remedies are context specific. So the broad reaching works that could be realized from computer science and from political science have yet to impact any d data decision making at all. With the one exception that I know of, and if you know of one, I'd be happy to know it, and that is re-identification experiments. And in this workshop, as Cynthia pointed out, one of the most significant important things that could come from here is that it brings together efforts across these different silos. And so if a field of data privacy is to achieve its full potential, it has to funnel cross-disciplinary knowledge into specific domains, and then it has to take that knowledge from specific domains and broaden it back out again so that it can be delivered to other domains. And the kinds of domains, well, I think you can just easily understand they are things like they've gone on for a long time. They include things like telecommunications, from uh, eavesdropping all the way to voice over IP. They include surveillance. They include um, identification, and so forth and so on. OK, so now I think I clearly has, I hope you understand what I mean when I say data privacy, what it is. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about its origins. And in general, the information about you provides strategic advantage to someone somewhere. And that's what drives this. So here's an example from nature. Consider two lions playing in the bush around a water hole. One of the lions spots some prey at the water hole, and he wants to get closer to the prey without the other lion knowing. It, because he feels that if the other lion knows, he may get there first and he may lose his advantage. If the prey knows, the prey may run away and he again would lose. So the privacy of his intention and the knowledge and his knowledge gives him a strategic advantage. Announcing his knowledge widely, making it public, would lose him his advantage. He needs secrecy. Vowing to protect the information you share with professionals has, I don't know what is with my slides. OK, sorry. There's a double click required. And it's a mouse, I mean a Mac, so it should be a single click thing. But anyway, 
Vowing to protect the information you share with professionals has long been necessary for establishing trust. A good example is doctor-patient confidentiality. The historical origin and ethical basis of medical confidentiality begins with the Hippocratic Oath, written about the 6th century BC and the 1st century AD. And the oath states that whosoever I sh whatsoever I shall see or hear in the course of my dealings, if it be what should not be published abroad, I will never divulge holding such things to be holy secrets. So let me give you some lineages that relate to the kinds of work that many of you do in this area so that we have some common ground as to why it is sometimes we talk past one another. So one of them is the lineage of population statistics. The counting of citizens can be traced back to biblical recordings of Moses. In the book of Numbers, Moses counted people in the area surrounding his kingdom in order to strengthen the count of the population under his control. And we see these long lists of counts and we see these long lists of names as example. In the United States, the US Bureau of Census is required to conduct a count of all persons in the US every 10 years. This results from many, has many purposes, but it started because of the need to determine the number of representatives in Congress as prescribed by the US Constitution. By 1800, the census collected more refined age information. In 1810, it collected economic information. In 1820, it collected more detailed occupational information. In 1830, it collected information on physical disability. In 1840, it collected investment and productivity information. And so the expansion continued with every single census until today. It continues to get larger and larger. In 1850, up to 1850, all information collected was made publicly available, completely explicitly identified. But after the Civil War, in which the census data had been used, a, a horrible distrust emerged and an extreme power concern over, a concern over the power of the government emerged. And so we found ourselves with Title 13, which threatens criminal penalties to census worker if privacy is violated making it among the strongest privacy protections in the United States. This is the lineage of statistical offices worldwide and to some extent the lineage of differential privacy. Let me give you another lineage, human subjects research. In 1946, 23 Nazi ph physicians went on trial at Nuremberg for crimes committed against prisoners of war. These crimes included exposure of humans to extremes of temperature, mutilati mutilation surgery, and deliberate infections with various lethal path pathogens. During the trial, the fundamental ethical standards for the conduct of research involving humans were codified into the Nuremberg Code. The two most important conditions were the need for voluntary informed consent of subjects and a scientifically valid research design that could pr produce results for the good of society. In the 1960s, America's general attention to human and civil rights increased at a time when the New York Times reported that researchers in New York injected elderly indigent people with live cancer, live cancer cells without their consent. In the 1970s, it was revealed that since the 1930s, approximately 400 black men in Tuskegee, Alabama had been involved without their knowledge in a lengthy study called the Tuskegee Syphilis, Syphilis Study to study the natural history of the disease. The men were systematically denied penicillin even after its introduction as the standard treatment of the disease. These events culminated in the Belmont Report in 1979 that set up the ethical principles and the framework for what we know today as the guiding, guiding guidelines of IRBs, institutional review boards. One of the things that's important to uh, the three the three cornerstones are informed consent that the research had to be beneficial to and minimized harm and that you had to be, had to have justice and treat the subjects fairly. One of the important things that I bring this to your attention today though is because we are in the middle of a comment period in which the rules of engagement for IRBs are, are being reconsidered in the most sweeping of ways. And so one of the things that we would like you to consider, for those of you who are interested, I know there are at least two responses coming. One is led by Salil Badan who wants to make sure things like differential privacy don't get uh, rolled right over. And another one is uh, spearheaded by people in my lab to make sure that data privacy in the large things like re-identification experiments and things like that don't get ignored or uh, are unusable. 
So there are a lot of different lineages, and they have different remedies. And they include all kinds of things. In the interest of time, we're certainly not going to go through all of them that have an impact on, on computer technology. Um, and in fact, I just realized my clock is not working either. How am I doing on time? I'm OK? All right. Well, just, just say stop, and I will stop mid-sentence. Oh, cool. All right, thank you. Uh, so in the 70s, the government, uh, but I did want to bring a couple of other ones to bring us up to date to the settings we sit in today as to why it is, even at its best, I don't want us to, to, to believe what are the challenges, one, for something like differential privacy, but also why differential privacy can't possibly address everything and, all, and what it is we should do about that. So in the 70s, Weston pr produced a book called Privacy and Freedom. And his, one of the cornerstones of his thing is he says that control and freedom are diametrically opposed. The less control you have over your data, the less freedom you have. And this really dovetails with this notion of informed consent and becomes um, sort of this interesting backdrop against some new directions that are taking place where more and more power is where people are being asked to provide their information. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. The other thing that happened in the 70s was the Social Security Administration published guidelines on how to render data sufficiently de-identified. They said you have to use a small sampling fraction, usually one in a thousand. You can't include any geographic code. You only knew that the record came from somewhere in the United States. And uh, for every combination of characteristics, there had to be at least five other individuals who matched that combination. And certainly, this is the lineage to K-anonymity, as well as to many of the risk, model, risk models that are used under HIPAA. Another example were the fair information practices. I think many of you have seen these, and they also came out in the 70s, so I'll skip them at this time. By the mid-1990s, a big explosion of data privacy issues occur. And this explosion happened because of the, distorage, the cost of disk storage plummeted. And as a result, it was just simply easy to collect data. And so this trend wasn't limited to the government, but I want to show you just how that trend worked in the 90s by only, using, only looking at government. In 1995, a big question that came before Congress was, why is health care so expensive? And so Hillary Clinton wanted to tackle the problem. And at the time, everyone agreed health care was expensive, but no one knew why. So state by state, the answer became to start a new data collection called hospital discharge data. This is a copy of the fields for every hospital visit, not only collected, but also simply provided. You or anyone else can get a copy of those data. In the 1990s, there was a problem about deadbeat parents, and so Congress responded with what was called the Directory of New Hires. Everyone in here who ever has had a job since the 1990s is in the Directory of New Hires, whether you have children or not, and whether you defaulted on any uh, 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 benefits to your child. Another one was, can we identify children who are at risk early to save money? Uh, and that started us with the uh, electronic birth certificate database that I showed you earlier. Another problem was, could we improve public health because there had been an outbreak among a college campus? And so the, that began what's known as the immunization registries. And even just to give you an example, even though we could play the same game and show you how data collection exploded in the 1990s commercially, uh, one great example, of course, is loyalty cards. Uh, and this happened because of a, uh, this, this explosion in loyalty cards happened because uh, Coca-Cola ran a, a, um, a, a uh, they did a study in Dominique's, Dominique's um, uh, try that again, Dominique's Market, I think is how it's pronounced, in uh, Chicago. And what, they, what, what was so amazing was it totally changed the way grocery stores thought about who their customers were. It violated everything that they had thought before. Before, they thought their competition was for convenience stores and so forth, but they found that it was a total new profile, simply, and that was only possible by being able to look at what individuals were buying collectively. And so this is an example of what's associated with grocery data purchases. And of course, since 2000, we find ourselves in a surveillance society. And I'll, in the interest of time, I'll skip ahead of that. So Cynthia made a great point, and I loved it when she says, you know, this, this is a lot like early cryptography. There's been this circle effect. And even though I call this, uh, this uh, label remedies, it really, has, it really has this irky circular feel that she was just talking about. 
In fact, uh, whenever I give that part of that talk to young people, young college students, uh, they become a little distressed about now in the talk. They feel that the battle is already lost. So one of the things I have to do is I have to show you that the water is not already spilled and that there, that there are ways that we can move forward with personal data in a data-rich society. But I think in order to do that, we're going to have to come forward. We're not going to be able to stay safely in our silos unless you just don't want to affect change. So let me talk first about de-identification. I think we all understand it. It was simply the removal of explicit identifiers. We were able to show very early on that simply removing something like the name and address out of uh, hospital data in particular, uh, we could simply link it on the demographics to put back the identity of the individuals. And then we were able to talk about these basic demographics across the United States. And as, they, and as you would imagine, as I generalize from date of birth to year of birth and from five digit zip code to county, the, the percentage of individuals in the United States that would be uniquely identified by those characteristics does in fact fall. So one way, so we took the HIPAA safe harbor and we asked the same question. What percentage of the United States is identified if I had information and I was releasing it under the safe harbor throughout the United States? And that turns out to be the same as 0.04%. So that, that's a, and, and that no state was exempt from individuals being re-identified. So one thing that we could say is that the safe harbor, in whatever its wisdom may be, that, that prescribes the explicit removal of those 18 fields does not give you guaranteed anonymity. Another one is consent and notice. I think we've all sort of had our share of these click-through agreements. And, and when was the last time you actually, whenever did anyone read one? And uh, certainly have you read one in the last five years or three years? Uh, but yet consent and, consent and notice continues to drive. We spend a lot of attention in policy with a lot of focus on the immediate recipients of our data. But most of the data goes away through the back door. Again, unable for us to, unable to figure out who it is who has information about us that could affect us. Um, we've talked a lot about HIPAA. I just want to ground us in the same idea here of how it functions. So HIPAA co covers some group of entities who have ha um, medical information about you, primarily people who have to get paid uh, or part of the payment process. There's this idea of a privacy wall, and on the other side of the privacy wall, the data are free. And so one way to get the data free is to adhere to what's called the safe harbor, that is, the, the, it prescribes, if you remove this and it lists 18 fields of information, then the data's free to give away. And that was the data that we said had the 0.04% re-identification rate. And another way is the scientific standard. And I'm going to talk about it, but first I just want to point out that not everyone, so unlike Canada and unlike Europe, not everyone who holds medical data, who holds the same medical data, is covered under HIPAA. So this is a, so not, so independent of every time I talk about a different domain of a problem, there's a new rule or a new law that applies in the United States, a different one. In addition, in the space of HIPAA, two, in the, two groups can have the same data and one be covered and one not. And the one that's not covered is free to release their data in any way they want. And a great example of that was the hospital discharge data that I showed you earlier, which was far more identifiable than what you could get under HIPAA. So there are three ways to free the data, the safe harbor, a special arrangement with researchers called a limited data set, and this last one, the scientific standard that has this notion of a minimal chance. And so this is what uh, Devin referred to earlier, too, in, in her conversation with Cynthia about whether or not Epsilon, if you wanted to do virtual privacy, could fit there. This is also the space in which a lot of really good work has happened on risk modeling and risk assessment. But the risk modeling and risk assessment work also has problems because it's too hidden, it's not transparent. In order to assess the risk, I have to have a good population model and I have to have a really good understanding of what are the available data sets. But we don't have a public registry of data sets, for example. So how, so anyone's guess uh, could still be a problem. Let me just say, I only have like one minute left. So let me just say a couple of things about the horizons. 
Um, I'm certainly not going to talk about differential privacy, and even if I were, I certainly wouldn't talk about it after Cynthia Dwork just talked. But, <laughs> but what I can say is, what do I think its biggest challenges are to have impact on the real world? Right now, it, it, there is no law for, for which differential privacy um, offers a solution in one way of thinking about it. In another way of thinking about it, the couple of laws, like at the Census Bureau and so forth, where we might say differential privacy is a great example, there's no incentive to move from something they're already doing. So one of the challenges for uh, that body of work is to find a way to package itself in the broader policy environment and begin to figure out how to change the policy environment so that it has a footing. So I've given many, uh, I've given many, I was invited to many K KDD sessions. So those of you who are from privacy preserving data mining won't be shocked when I again say, you have to work on a real world problem. Now I know that while that may have been more true earlier, it's less true now in that we see a lot more activity in problems that would be aligned with the things that individuals really face. But one of the problems that privacy preserving data mining had for a long time was that once we made our mathematical abstraction, we, we made our abstractions and we made a nice mathematical model, we were content with that. And then we went to perfect that model and improve these improve those models. And the fact that the real world problems that were showing up on the front page of the New York Times had no bearing on the problems we were working was a horrible, from my vantage point, was just an incredibly horrible mismatch. There had to be a thousand brilliant people working on privacy preserving data mining. There were all these privacy problems. Um, and so then we talk about risk assessment. I'm just going to take 10 seconds to tell you about two new things that are on the horizon that are new for this community. One of them is George Church's work on the Personal Genome Project. It's called Open Consent. The idea is that you get individuals to sign a release that releases you from any obligation, uh, that you absolutely will not give them any privacy guarantee, and that they take all of the risk if they give their data to you. And what's amazing is that he has a thousand online profiles of medical data and genomic data of a thousand people who've made that. And then yesterday we were talking and he now has 1,500, he has 500 more. And this idea of open consent is getting a lot of traction. The last one is a project we have going called Personal Access Control. It's part of a large, large, lot of efforts to push more information under individual control. And maybe we'll have the time to talk about that another time. So let me stop there, thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Are there any questions? Going once, going twice. No, thank you. Okay. Thank let you. Me, let me just much. say one thing. But I still love privacy-preserving data mining. I don't want to. I see Chris Clifton about to jump out of his chair at me. Thank you.